we had kept on reading, we would have saw, we would have seen that Isaiah's call is very challenging. So this professor says that if Isaiah had known what was coming, he wouldn't have gone to the temple that day. And if he had realized what his call from God was going to mean, he would have sat on his hands instead of saying, here I am, send me. Well, we'll get into more about why that's true in a minute, but let's, let's set the scene. The time is 740 BCE, and Isaiah, who is not yet a prophet, goes to the temple where he has this astounding vision. I like what one of the commentators, a woman named Melinda Quivick, says about the vision. She says, you can't imagine how massive it is. It says that in this vision, the hem, think about the hem on a garment. The hem of God's garment fills the temple. Just the hem. I said in the earlier service, just think of a hem filling that whole space in the sanctuary. <clears throat> just the hem. How big would God have to be? And that's what Isaiah saw. And then there were these strange but faithful creatures attending God, and the whole thing was obscured by smoke. Let's talk about those creatures. There are the seraphs. Six wings, it says. They're descendants, according to one of the commentators, of an ancient monster that was thought to sit in the heavens the name seraph means fiery. This was an ancient fiery monster that sat in the heavens just waiting for the right moment to come down and terrorize the earth. Sounds like a video game, doesn't it? <laughs> or maybe that movie I saw, the Avengers movie. <laughs> but these seraphs, in the lesson we read today, are not waiting for their moment to, um, to be terrors. Instead, they're attending God. In fact, they are God's press agents. They are shouting the eternal glory of God, and they are serving God. And between their wings flapping and their proclamations of God's glory, it's so loud that the foundations of the earth shakes. This is what Isaiah experiences. So how does Isaiah respond? Well, how would any of us respond? I mean, really. Isaiah proclaims his own unworthiness and the unworthiness of the people of God. And then one of those seraphs comes to attend Isaiah, but not to comfort him. Now, what comes next is a little disconcerting if you take it literally. Because one of the seraphs, and remember, six-winged creature, fiery creature, that alone would scare the you-know-what out of you, goes to the altar fire with a pair of tongs, takes a coal, and goes to Isaiah and touches his lips. <laughs> Two. <laughs> and touches his lips and burns away Isaiah's guilt and shame. The message is, of course, that God is willing to forgive our guilt and our sin in order to make us respond to his call. So, only then does Isaiah, when God says, Whom shall we send? We, did you notice the we? Appropriate on Holy Trinity Sunday. Whom shall we send? Isaiah says, Here I am, send me. But, 
John Holbert from Perkins Theology School says he would have put his hand down if he'd known what was coming next, which we didn't read. You should go home and read it. Because God says to Isaiah, okay, you said yes, so this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to the people of Israel, and you are going to preach to them. And you're going to do it in such a way that they do not understand what you are saying. So that there's no possible way that they will repent. Now, I do that all the time. But <laughs> not on purpose. <laughs> Talk about being set up for failure. And when Isaiah says, how long? Do I have to do this? God says, until all is desolate. Well, I bet he was glad he said yes. Doesn't does it really encourage responding to God's call. And in fact, it might cause us to think even more than we might already think that we are glad that only certain special people who God loves, you think so? Who God loves receives God's call. However, I hate to tell you, the rest of Scripture, the overriding message of Scripture, is that we all are called. And so then that causes us to ask ourselves, well then, if I'm called, what is my purpose? What is my personal mission? And to answer that second question, I want to just take something from this book. I'm recommending it. It's called Reclaiming the V Word, Renewing Life at Its Vocational Core. It's by Dave Daubert, who was a classmate of mine in seminary, and Tanya Kobos. Dave, Dave and Tanya point out in their book that there is only one mission in the world. We do not have such a thing as a personal mission. The one mission in the world is God's mission. And God's mission is to love and to bless the world. Now as Christians, we believe that that mission is, comes to completion in Jesus. And that Jesus and the Holy Spirit cause God's kingdom to break into our world until that day that God's kingdom comes in completion, which of course is in God's hands and we trust in God. So in the meantime, our part, our call, is to figure out how we can participate in God's mission, not our mission, in God's mission to love and to bless the world. And the way that we can start thinking about that is to think about the various roles that we play in our lives. I'm going to name some. I probably won't name them all, but, you know, some of us are employees or students or volunteers. We may be parents, grandparents, spouses, student, or spouses, children. We may be citizens. You know, the list could go on and on. So think about the various roles that you play and realize that you can respond to God's call in any of those aspects of your life. So let's, let's talk about uh, a person in the book whose name is Andy. Andy works in a factory. And some people would say that Andy's work in a factory is just a job, just, you know, drudgery, basically. But that's the first thing we need to think about here. In Andy's role as an employee, he creates, he helps create a product that's needed in our world. He earns money that helps to care for his family. He earns money that can be shared with people beyond his family in the ministry of his church or meeting the needs of others. 
And he interacts with people day in and day out as he goes to work. God can, God is using Andy just in those things. Because God has no interest in, you know, us making things that are unproductive, in, our, in us ignoring our families or our neighbors, or in um, our living in isolation. So, in that, God is using Andy to love and bless the world. But there's other ways that God is using Andy to love and bless the world. Andy loves elderly people. So he volunteers at his congregation to visit people who are homebound. But Andy also is concerned for those who are struggling. So he cooks and helps to feed people who are, are struggling due to the economic downturn. Now those two are pretty basic, not surprising, for a guy who works at a factory. The third one I found surprising. And the author said that it's this third one where Andy says he feels he's really making a difference. Andy likes to talk with people about their lives having meaning. And so instead of in the lunchroom or, you know, at, at the restaurant, wherever he finds himself, talking about mowing the lawn or the baseball game, he introduces conversation about what people find to be meaningful in their lives. And is open about his own experience. And over and over again, he's been told how significant that is, that he's willing to have that conversation with people, this blue-collar guy who works in a factory. Now, Andy participates in God's mission to love and bless the world, but most of the time he's not in the church building. More significantly, he is out in the world responding to God's call. Now, we all do that. I'm sure every person here does that. But we may not be completely aware that we're doing it. So I would like to challenge you to do something. Take one of those aspects of your life, parent, student, child, employee, volunteer. Take one of those aspects of your life and think about a new or an enhanced way that you can participate in God's kingdom to bless and love the world. We know that if we're intentional about something, then we are more effective, and if we are more effective, then the opportunity for other people to be transformed and for ourselves to be transformed is better. So, think about just one part of your life and how, at that moment, as a friend maybe, you can intentionally participate in God's mission to love and bless not too long ago in confirmation class, we were talking about what difference would it make if everything you did, you did for God. That, you know, you took a math test and you did it for God, or you went to basketball practice and you did it for God. Well, it's sort of that concept. And then I want you to, after you've thought about this and you've tested it out a little, Share it with somebody. It doesn't have to be me, but maybe share it with somebody in the congregation. So you have a sense of, of confirmation. Because we, we spend a lot of time saying, I don't know what God's purpose is for me. Well, this is a way to have that confirmed as you share it with other people. You know, most of us, 
will never have a vision like Isaiah did. Thanks be to God. <laughs> and we may not have a call as challenging as Isaiah's, although the one that we do have may be daunting enough. But that doesn't mean that we're not called. You know, we spend a lot of time in this day and age talking about our carbon footprint and how we need to lessen our carbon footprint, meaning we need to lessen the negative impact that we have on the environment. And that's true. But we also need to talk about God's footprint. And the principle is just the opposite when it comes to God's footprint. We want to maximize God's footprint. So that when we leave a place, you know, maybe you, you go home from buying groceries, or you uh, go home after, after being at work, whatever it might be. You go home after um, being at your child's school. So that when we leave, people will know that God was there because of the mark that we made. That's what happens when we say, here I am, send me. Amen. Amen.